student of mine in ecclesiology class at the seminary. And I always remember him saying to his students, now you guys listen to this. This is really, really, really important. And the issue that we were talking about in the class at that time is what, is what he will be addressing today, which is the congregation as the bride of Christ. I know, Tim, we've gone over a little bit here, but we're going to call you forward. If you could take about 20, 25, 20, 25 minutes, Tim will give you that time. Is that okay? Yep. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you today. I am Pastor Alex Amiant. I serve our Saviors with the Church in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, uh, for these last two years since finishing our seminary. Um, what kind of what kind of seminarians do you want coming out of the seminary? What kind of pastors do you desire for our congregations? Do you want pastors who who absolutely love the congregation before they even know which congregation they're going to? That would that would be a wonderful thing. One of the effects of, of reading what the Bible says about the congregation, reading Lutheran teaching on the congregation, and reading what Georg Sverdrup wrote about the congregation was that I fell in love with the congregation. And I became in awe of who the congregation was in Christ. And I became excited to serve the congregation. And the thing about being in seminary is that uh, you don't know if you're going to be a pastor or if you're going to go back to the cubicle. Um, it depends on if a congregation extends a call to you and the Lord leads you to accept that call and then, okay, that's, that's finally when you know that you're called to be a pastor. And so I, in seminary, learning about who the congregation was in Christ, his very bride, his body, gave me a a love for the congregation and a great desire to, to serve <laughs> as a pastor. I'm going to ask for uh, your participation just briefly a couple times. And the first one is to give me some words that describe us according to the flesh. According to our sinful nature, what are some words that describe us? These are typically not flattering words. And of course, not describe a description of you personally, but children of wrath. Okay, children of wrath. All right. Uh, other descriptions, of course, they do describe us, but they describe everyone according to the flesh. The sinners saved by grace. Okay, sinners, right? According to the flesh, we are sinners. Yeah. And thank God that we're saved by grace. That's according to Christ. All right. Other words that describe us according to the flesh. Self. Self-centered. Okay, self-centered. Self yeah, we're looking inward. Depraved. Depraved. Okay. Dead in our trespasses and sin. Dead in our trespasses and sin. Okay, so these are words that describe us according to the flesh. I would add that that we're weak. Um, that that we are messy. You know, we're we're not clean and pure and and straight laced, but uh, we have issues. What are words that describe us according to Christ? What are words that describe us according to faith in Christ? Saints. Saints. Okay. And saints comes from a word that also has another English word that starts with H, meaning holy. Okay, so we're, we're holy ones. All right, so what are other words that describe us according to to Christ. Beloved, I've been redeemed. Beloved, redeemed. Yet yeah, redeemed means that bought back, bought back from all of those things that describe us according to the flesh. We're saints, we're holy, redeemed, beloved. We're forgiven. We're righteous. This is who we are according to Christ. And that is justification. Justification is, is God's declaration that you are righteous in his sight on account of Jesus Christ. Not 
according to your own works, but through faith. What are some words that describe the collective body of all believers? We call it the church. What are, what are some words that describe the, the universal church? The royal priesthood. Okay, the royal priesthood. Those being made holy. Those being made holy, okay. You mentioned justification. Yes. Sanctification. Okay, sanctification. Okay. Other words. You know, like, like individual, but the church is holy, pure, righteous. Okay. In, in the sight of God. All right. It is holy, pure, righteous. Yeah. Without sin in Christ. We say it in the Creed, I believe in the, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints. There's another way of talking about the Christian church. What are words that are sometimes used to describe the local congregation? Body of believers. Body of believers, okay. Church. Okay, the church, yeah. The bride. The bride. That's where we're going. It, it does happen that sometimes, or often, the universal congregation, all believers everywhere, is spoken of in one way. And the local congregation is, is spoken of more in, in terms of of a messy place with a less than status compared to the holy universal congregation. It, it's spoken of more as a place where there's a, a mixture and it's not totally pure. And, and sadly, that's not just how some people speak of the local congregation, but it's also just a natural temptation of our flesh to look around us in church and to see one another according to their flesh. But how does the Bible talk about the local congregation? Think about the Philippians. It seems like that congregation was doing a few things right, at least. Paul wrote to them, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Okay, he wrote the same kind of introduction to the Ephesians, speaking of them as saints, as, as holy ones in Christ Jesus. And when he wrote to the Philippians, he was speaking with great joy and encouragement. But what about the Corinthian congregation? That, that gave us a different picture of a local congregation. They had a lot of issues. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 2 through 4. So if, if the Corinthians have a lot of issues, then it, it would be good to see how Paul addresses them. I'll just read a few verses from the beginning of his first letter to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Okay, well, how does that square with what we know about the Corinthian congregation? When I think about the Corinthians, I think about a messy congregation. And yet, how does Paul approach them? He calls them the church of God, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, grace to you in peace, giving thanks to God because of the grace of God that was given to them in Christ Jesus. When Paul talks about them, as a congregation. He talks about them in terms of how God sees them in Christ. In Christ, what does the congregation in Corinth look like to God? 
looks like his holy bride. Free from sin, death, and the devil. Free from those burdens and baggage. He sees his body living because all who believe have Christ living in them. Free and alive. Free and living refers primarily to who a congregation is in Christ as a justified congregation. I'm going to read a quote from Georg Sverdrup where he... No, this is not a quote from Georg Sverdrup. This is a quote from Pastor Mark Horn. <laughs> the illustrious Pastor Horn once said, Sverdrup believed that the failure to recognize the holiness of the congregation leads to a diminished view of the congregation and to unbiblical judgmentalism and strife. Because of the dissatisfaction over the sin and unbelief within it, some treat the congregation with disdain. They either stand above and apart in judgment of their congregation or leave it altogether. Others are tempted to take matters into their own hands and seek to purify the congregation by human means. This judgmental spirit inevitably ends with the congregation in discord. Thus, failure to recognize the congregation's holiness is, is to remove the biblical basis for respecting the congregation and revering who God has made it to be in Christ. Since the New Testament refers to local congregations as the body of Christ, God's congregations and God's temple, Sergeant wrote, it behooves us also to speak with all reverence and respect of this divine institution among us and deem it very highly for the sake of Christ and God. This was a joyful thing for me to learn. And I don't know if I had any conscious thought otherwise, but to come upon this truth was, was awesome. The local congregation is not JV, while the universal congregation is varsity. The local congregation is not less than, while the universal congregation is where it's at. In Christ, all that is true about the universal congregation, the church, the body of believers, is true about your local congregation. Only one word is used in the Greek New Testament for the church, and that is the word ekklesia, better translated congregation. Sarah recognized that the New Testament used that word ekklesia in two senses. He said, the Holy Scripture speaks about the congregation in two ways. It speaks of one congregation and of many congregations. Sverdrup identified Jesus' conversation with Peter in which he said, On this rock I will build my church, or my congregation, in the former sense, the, the one congregation, universal. <clears throat> he identified Paul's greeting to the church of God that is in Corinth, with the latter sense, the local congregation in Corinth being one of many congregations. Although he recognized two scriptural senses of congregation, he didn't <coughs> picture them or conceive of them in any way as describing two different bodies. He believed there was one ecclesia, one congregation, and it's just seen from two different perspectives. He reacted strongly against the idea that Ecclesia was separate into two distinct bodies. If the two senses of congregation were different times, Sergeant wrote, they could not be called by the same name. It is the one and same body of Christ manifesting itself in different places. Because they're not different kinds but the same body of Christ, Sergeant concludes, all that is said about the one holy congregation is also said about each individual congregation at every place. It is, it is quite amazing to think of it.
if the congregation is holy in Christ, then why don't we always see it in the people? One helpful line is from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. And so we believe it, though we don't always see it. It's a holiness by faith. Sverdra wrote, The holiness of the congregation must be believed in, because it cannot be seen, and yet it is a true and living reality. The congregation is holy, not through its own, but through God's holiness. It is a gathering of people who have dared to take up for their own and their fellow men's use the only holy thing that is found on earth, the Lord's word and the sacraments. This fellowship is holy, not because the members are holy, but because the Lord is there with the Spirit and grace. If the congregation rightly uses the means of grace and repentance and faith, and with hearts yearning for the Spirit's graceful work, then the Spirit makes it holy, and by it forms Christ's body, and builds himself that house which is built of living stones. This is the nature of the local congregation. It's the same nature as the universal body of believers, forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, seen by God in Christ as his bride free and as his body living. The result of this should be that we have a sense of, of reverence for the local congregation, a sense of awe at what we experience on a Sunday morning, a sense of awe at, at what we see before us as believers gather around word and sacrament. This was, this was really wonderful for me as a, a new pastor to my first call knowing that I, I was coming with really no experience and not knowing how best to, to serve the people that I was seeing in the congregation and passing in, in the halls at church. And it was such a comfort to me to look at these, these people as precious souls called the Bride of Christ and to start there. Another result is that we see the congregation as, as more than just a mission field. Congregation is a mission field that continually needs to hear the gospel. And yet it's more than a mission field because it is the bride and body of Christ. It becomes a missionary itself. And another result from recognizing who the congregation is in Christ is that we recognize that growth in the congregation comes from the living proclamation of God's word. And that living proclamation is law and gospel proclamation, where the law reveals sin and it slays us, it puts to death our sinful flesh, and the gospel forgives sin and comforts the sorry sinner. It makes us alive. The gospel gives life. And the doctrine of who the congregation is in Christ is gospel. And what that means is that when you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit as a sinner, comfort for you is that your sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. And God has brought you into his believing church, his bride, his body. You're forgiven. You are free. You are alive. Free and living. This gave me an awe for the congregation. It gave me an excitement to live in the congregation and serve the congregation. Turn briefly as we close now to Ephesians chapter 5. This passage which was so well loved by Georg Sverdrup. Ephesians chapter 5 beginning with the second half of verse 25 and reading through verse 27. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of God are spoken of as the, the bride of God. And here in the New Testament, Christ gives himself up for the church. And what do we see here? We see a picture of the bride of Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church. The congregation. Which congregation? The congregation as it exists universally and as it exists in each local spot. Christ loves this local congregation, his bride. He has freed this bride from bondage to sin, death, and the devil. We do talk rightly in the AFLC about working for free and living congregations. And as Pastor Horn mentioned, Part of what puts our freedom at risk is, is legalism, which is a temptation in every human heart to find comfort according to your own good works, not finding comfort in Christ alone. Uh, temptation is to be in bondage and sin. And so we need to continually work for freedom in the congregation because those are traps. Those are traps for slavery. And yet, we do not begin with our work in that direction. We begin with the comfort of who we are in Christ. His bride. In Christ, we are free. And as you struggle, and you wish that you, your life looked like it was more free from sin than it really is, a comfort for you is that God looks at you according to Christ. And in Christ, you are free. You are his bride, whom he has cleansed. Paul says that he might sanctify her, which means that he might make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. God is always at work to do this work through his word. His word as it's active, in baptism, his word as it's active in Holy Communion. Sverdrup was so strong on a, a living faith, and he was so strong on the source of that faith coming to us from God through the means of grace. The word of God in baptism and Holy Communion. And so, we rejoice that even we are part of the Bride of Christ, and as we go back to our congregation, we rejoice that we are living in the, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. We are free and living congregations in Christ. That we rest in that truth and in that comfort, in that grace, and in the strength that God provides, we also work for free and living congregations. Any questions? heart, there's a sorry heart, there's a hurting heart, then 
this is the bride of Christ, and they need the comfort that they are forgiven in Christ. That God looks at them not according to their weakness, not according to their failure, but He forgives them through Jesus Christ. I'll make uh, one more comment that's come to mind, and, and that is, uh, what about unbelievers who are also in attendance at church? Because when Paul talks about the congregation, what he's talking about are believers gathered around word and sacrament. And we see this all the way back to the start of the congregation in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached and then the people said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. And, you know, for the forgiveness of your sin, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, this promise is for you and for your children. And they did. And then right after that, they began gathering around what? The word and the regular administration of the sacraments, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so we gather as believers around the word and the sacraments regularly, and that's, that's a congregation. And the way God speaks of congregations is in these high and lofty terms, as Christ's body and Christ's bride. And one very helpful thing that, that Sturgeon did was he distinguished between the congregation's essence in its spiritual sense as a body of believers and the necessary external organization of the congregation since we still live in this world like on this side of eternity. We have a membership role. That's part of the external organization. We have stated times and places for our meetings. That's part of the external organization. And without fail, it will happen that unbelievers connect themselves to the external organization of the congregation. And Lord have mercy that they would hear the word of God and believe. That would that's wonderful. But the presence of unbelievers connected to the external organization of the congregation does not make the congregation itself impure. It does, does not put a spot on the bride of Christ. Christ has presented the congregation to himself, pure and spotless, the washing of water and the word. And so that has been a helpful distinction for me as I try to, to navigate these these two obvious truths that I, one that I see in Scripture and one that I see with my eyes. In Scripture, there, the congregation is pure gospel and comfort, and, and then with my eyes, I think, well, are there unbelievers connected externally to congregations? Well, sure. And that was a, a helpful distinction from Spirit for me and perhaps for you.